Hello class! Today we're continuing to discuss the puzzle of material constitution as described by Ted Sider in Chapter 7 of Riddles of Existence, written by Earl Connie and Ted Sider. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. Which assumption in the puzzle of material constitution does the just matter theory deny? 2. What should we not confuse the just matter theory with? 3. What is the just matter theory specifically? 4. Which unwelcome consequence does the just matter theory face? 5. How might we phrase this unwelcome consequence as an objection to the just matter theory? 6. Which assumption in the puzzle of material constitution does the takeover theory deny? 7. What is the takeover theory saying specifically? 8. Which unwelcome consequence does the takeover theory face? 9. How might we phrase this unwelcome consequence as an objection to the takeover theory? Alright, as always, when I give the answers to these questions in the course of this lecture, you'll want to pause the video and write them down or type them up or crochet them into a sweater or hammer them into a nice sculpture, however it is that you remember the information and compartmentalize it. So, when we last discussed the puzzle of material constitution, we noticed that it is an inconsistent tetrad. That is, it's four assumptions, each of which seem, you know, plausible on their own, but which together entail a contradiction. They can't all be true. So, we need to figure out which one of them is the suspect one, which, which principle among the four we want to deny, and then we need to defend ourselves as we deny that bit of common sense. So consider the assumption called creation. That assumption says that by sculpting the clay, the sculptor brings a statue into existence which did not exist before. In other words, the statue didn't always exist, it came into existence in addition to the bit of matter when the sculptor sculpted it. Some philosophers might look at that assumption and say, well, I don't know about that, bringing something else into existence, the statue, maybe that's the problem. Maybe what we should do is deny this assumption. Let's deny the assumption called creation and say that actually, when the clay was sculpted, nothing was brought into existence. The statue is the clay. The statue is already there. This is the just matter theory, or at least the just matter theory is the theory that denies this assumption called creation. Now, it's important not to be confused by the just matter theory, especially considering its name. Just matter theory, that theory we're considering now, is not the view that the world is just matter, or that matter is all that there is, or that the universe is in some sense basically material. All of those philosophical ideas are materialism, and as we'll see, there isn't a single solution to the puzzle of material constitution, or purported solution, that can't accept a version of materialism. So don't confuse the just matter theory with the idea that the world is just matter, or something like that, no. The just matter theory is called that because, according to the just matter theory, an object, like a book, just is its matter. In other words, the just matter theorist thinks that the statue is the hunk of stone. They're numerically identical. The cat is a hunk of cat meat. They're numerically identical. The soda can just is a hunk of aluminum. And so on. So the just matter theory is sort of a flat-footed denial that an object is anything more than its matter. In other words, it's the view that says that an object just is a hunk of matter. Now, if you recall the way that we set up the puzzle of material constitution, you'll remember that there is a problem with this. We can't say that a statue just is a hunk of clay, because, after all, it seems like we could destroy the statue without harming the hunk of clay. All you need to do is squish the statue flat, and voila, statue is gone, clay remains. But this is where the just matter theorist digs in their heels. Instead of agreeing, that the statue gets destroyed, the just matter theorist will say that the statue did not get destroyed. It's still there, even if you squish it. Why? Because the clay is still there, and the just matter theory says that the statue is the clay. 
and likewise with the hunk of clay before it was even sculpted. According to the Just Matter theory, the hunk of clay is the statue, and so the statue existed before the hunk of clay was even sculpted. It was already there. And here's where we get to what might be an unwelcome consequence for the Just Matter theory. For, according to our best sciences, it looks like our universe operates under something like a conservation of matter, where matter doesn't really get created or destroyed, it just changes forms. It's always there in existence, the material is. By saying a material object just is its constituent matter, this conservation of matter entails something rather surprising. Namely, that it's impossible for any material object to be created or destroyed. And that is a bad consequence. We might think that in general matter can't be created or destroyed, but surely books can be created and destroyed, coffee mugs can be created and destroyed, people, cats, shoes, ships, sailing wax, cabbages, and kings. Those things can be created and destroyed, surely. But not according to the just matter theory. In the chapter on Constitution, Ted Sider brings up the person, Socrates, and points out that, according to the just matter theory, Socrates is identical to a chunk of matter. And as long as that chunk of matter exists, Socrates exists. Our laws of conservation of matter say that that chunk of matter always existed, moreover. So the just matter theory would entail that Socrates always existed and always will exist. Maybe he'll be scattered. Maybe he'll be shaped like something random in space, but it's still Socrates. No, 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 no. No, that is, that is some nonsense. And since this is an intro class, it's worth mentioning that when you do philosophy, you shouldn't forget what you already know. It can be exciting to consider some weird metaphysical viewpoints, and when you put on the philosophy cap, you go a little nuts and you think, yeah, maybe, maybe tables and chairs always existed, man. But then, you have to remember what common sense says. If you walk into the intro philosophy classroom, and then after looking at one puzzle for a little bit, you walk out saying that tables and chairs can never be brought into existence or destroyed, and that Socrates always existed, and things like that, then maybe something has gone wrong. Let's take this unexpected result and turn it into an objection to the just matter theory. The objection would go like this. If the just matter theory is true, then it is impossible for any material objects to be created or destroyed. But it is possible for material objects to be created and destroyed. So the just matter theory is not true. So that's the just matter theory and its perils. That's what we get if we try to deny the assumption known as creation as we face that objection. What happens if we deny the survival assumption, however? Consider the assumption of survival. It says that when the sculptor shapes the clay into a statue, it does not destroy the hunk of clay. Even though the clay has been sculpted statue-wise, there still exists a hunk of clay within it, constituting it, making it up. The hunk is still there, even though a statue has been added. What if we were to deny that? Well, that's what the takeover theory says. The takeover theory denies that the hunk of clay survives being sculpted into a statue. What happens instead is that when the clay gets sculpted, the hunk of clay is destroyed. There is no more hunk of clay. Instead, it's a statue. According to the takeover theory, it's more like this, that the hunk of clay was replaced as it was sculpted. As the clay was sculpted, it was sort of pushed out of existence to make room for the statue which was coming into existence bit by bit. What the takeover theory is saying is that no chunk of matter can survive being shaped or molded into a material object. If you take a hunk of wood and you carve a table out of it, there is no more hunk of wood, there's just a table. If a hunk of cat meat gestates into a kitten, well there is no more hunk of cat meat, it's just a kitten. Nor does a hunk of ceramic exist wherever you find a coffee mug, or a hunk of cellulose wherever you find a pad of paper. Nor does any portion of matter exist coincident with a material object. What the takeover theory is saying precisely is this. In any region of space that contains anything material, there is at most one material object, and that object's type is determined by its shape. 
and maybe it's history. In the reading, Ted Sider only mentions shape, and I feel that that's uncharitable to the takeover theorist. If shape was all that mattered, you could get into this sort of a problem, where, once the clay is sculpted, what makes it a statue is the fact that it's shaped that way. Anything shaped that way is a statue. But meanwhile, unbeknownst to us, there are chunks of ice and rock on the planet Pluto which have the exact same shape. If shape was all that mattered, then those chunks of ice and rock on Pluto would be statues. And that's counterintuitive and silly. Surely the takeover theorist can say something like this, that in any region of space where there's anything material, there's at most one material object, and which kind of object it is depends on, well, the shape of that object as well as its history. If it came into existence as a result of sculpting, then it's a statue. If it came into the existence as a result of natural forces, it's not. That's a kind of sophistication the takeover theorist can enjoy. Still, however, this takeover theory runs into some trouble. For it is crucial to the metaphysics of the takeover theory that wherever you have any portion of matter, there is at most one material object. There cannot be more. And so, if there's ever any question about which type of material object there is, there has to be a metaphysical matter of fact. Because there are some physical objects, some material objects, where it seems like their existence is more tied to social convention than to the metaphysics of the world. Ted Sider asks us to compare our way of thinking about sculptures and pieces of clay to the imagined perspective of a community that lives on Mars, the Martians who we haven't discovered yet. Here on Earth, all pieces of clay fall into one of two categories. There are the unsculpted hunks, just the hunks of clay, and there are the sculpted statues. And that's it, those are the two categories. There are hunks and there are statues. Maybe there are some borderline cases and maybe there's some puzzlement about when something is one rather than another. Can you have a statue of a hunk? But let's say that on Earth, there are just those two categories that we recognize. Either a piece of clay is unsculpted, in which case it's a hunk, or it's sculpted, in which case it's a statue. Over on Mars, things are different, however. The Martians think about chunks of clay uh, kind of like how we think about meteors and meteorites, right? Consider the difference between a meteor and a meteorite. The only difference is how close it is to the Earth's surface. If a chunk of space rock is way out there, then it's a meteor. But if a chunk of space rock enters the Earth's atmosphere, then it's a meteorite. Way out there, meteor. Closer to us, meteorite. Just a matter of distance. And that's how Martians think about bits of clay. There are two kinds of bits of clay. They don't care about how they're shaped or sculpted. There's the kind that are outside, out there. Those are the out pieces whether they're sculpted or not, they're out pieces. And then there are the chunks of clay that are indoors, closer to us. Those are the in pieces. And those are the only two kinds of clay. There are the out pieces, way out there, and there are the in pieces indoors. Whether they're sculpted or not does not matter. Those are the kinds of bits of clay that Martians recognize. All bits of clay are divided into out pieces and in pieces in the same way that we divide our bits of clay into hunks and statues. Now, as he mentions, Ted Sider gets this fun example from Eli Hirsch, who brought up uh, this sort of thing uh, in the concept of identity. He talks about in-cars and out-cars. Around the house, we joke about in-dogs and out-dogs, actually, when we let the dog out. But the problem emerges when we consider what it would mean to be a takeover theorist here. The takeover theorist says, that wherever there is some portion of clay, there is at most one object, one kind of object. So imagine we've got the bit of clay, and it's unsculpted, and it's also outdoors. The Earthling takeover theorist will say that it's a hunk, and it will survive being brought indoors and then back outdoors. The Martian takeover theorist will say that it's an outpiece, and it will not survive being brought indoors. If you try to take it indoors, you destroy it, and you have an in-piece instead. So it can't be that they're both correct. It can't be that there's a hunk 
and an outpiece, because they have different persistence conditions. A hunk can survive being brought indoors, an outpiece cannot. But if the takeover theory is true, there has to be a fact about this. There has to be a fact about whether it's a hunk or an outpiece. There has to be a fact over whether the earthlings are correct to divide all clay into hunks and statues, or whether the Martians are correct to divide them all between outpieces and in-pieces. There has to be a fact about that, and that's a little absurd. It seems a little absurd, and Ted Sider says anthropocentric, to claim that our convention of dividing bits of clay into hunks and statues is objectively correct, and that the Martian way of thinking is just totally wrong, and their whole culture is mistaken. And so Sider mentions anthropocentrism, and that's sort of a problem with takeover theory. However, I think we can put the point more strongly. We don't need to talk about the Martians and in-pieces and out-pieces. I want to consider an example by Ernest Sosa. Let's consider the fact that in our culture and in our way of thinking, we recognize the existence of snowballs. When there's snow on the ground and you heap it into a ball shape, then you have created a snowball. Snowballs are objects that exist, we recognize them in our culture and our way of going about things, and we tend to agree that's how you make a snowball, is you take some snow and you ball it up. Our culture also agrees that if you smash or scatter the snow that a snowball's made of, you've destroyed it. If I throw a snowball at you, and it explodes and all the snow goes on the ground, and then you scoop up the snow and then throw it, that's a different snowball. It's got little different bits in it, but even if it contained all and only the same bits, we'd say that I threw a snowball at you, you threw a snowball at me, but it wasn't the same snowball. According to our conceptual scheme, snowballs do not survive being flattened or exploded. But suppose you come from a different culture, where it's normal to think that you can throw the same snowball back and forth even though it explodes and gets flattened and it gets scattered, and sometimes you incorporate a bit new snow in it, maybe the constituent snow changes over time. And let's suppose that, for the sake of clarity, your culture calls such things snow disc -alls. So, I come from a culture that recognizes snowballs, but someone else comes from a culture that recognizes snow disc -alls. What's the difference? Well, a snowball cannot survive being flattened or exploded, but a snow disc -all can survive being flattened or exploded. Now, the thing that's wrong with takeover theory is that, according to takeover theory, one of us has to be objectively correct about how snow works when you ball it up. Takeover theory is committed, in other words, to a matter of fact about whether a snowball can survive being exploded and then reballed up again that one of the cultures is right, and another culture is wrong, and it's of metaphysical significance. That should strike us as weird. Because if there are any objects whose existence is a matter of mere social convention, surely snowballs are among them. So let's take this unwelcome consequence, which is admittedly hard to express in specific terms, and express it in specific terms. Let's phrase it as an objection. Here we go. First, if the takeover theory is true, then existing social conventions which concern the identity of objects are metaphysically privileged. But existing social conventions that concern the identity of objects are not metaphysically privileged. There's no reason why snowballs must exist, but snow discalls cannot. So the takeover theory is not true. And that's our objection to the takeover theory. The theory that you get if you deny the assumption called survival. Okay, so we've looked at a couple of philosophical theories which attempt to solve the puzzle of material constitution, the just matter theory and the takeover theory, and we've also looked at the objections which bedevil each of those theories. Next time we're going to continue looking at possible solutions to the puzzle of material constitution. We're going to look at muriological nihilism, and if we get a chance, the cohabitation theory. See you next time. Thanks for watching.